Suffolk Pod Show was produced and managed by podtalk.co.uk. I'm Mark Mason. And I'm Susanna Hornby. Episode 2. Talking to Nick Pandolfi, highly acclaimed and award-winning radio presenter and news correspondent with BBC Radio 4, BBC Suffolk and a host of other local and international radio stations. Nick is also an actor and a globally renowned voiceover artist, having been cast in a long list of TV dramas, blockbuster films and stage roles. Nick is passionate about media. He's a content expert and dedicates a great deal of his time to nurturing small businesses and startups in Suffolk through Mentor. We're lucky to have him here with us today. May we introduce Nick Pandolfi. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's lovely to be here and um, lovely to see the project developing. I, I was reminded of one of my broadcasting heroes, Eddie Mayer, formerly of, of BBC Radio 4's PM programme. Mm-hmm. And whenever the listening figures used to come out, he used to refer to the PM programme as Radio 4's big number two. And I, and I understand I'm, I'm your number two, so um, <laughs> I'm happy with that title. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm quite relieved in many, many ways indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, you're so well known in Suffolk and Obviously, that's no surprise. Um, But we're looking forward to hearing about everything that you're up to at the moment. But we'd love to rewind a bit because you began life or rather your career as a child actor. I did. Yes, indeed. I was incredibly blessed. And uh, I'm sure anyone in in a similar profession to mine will will talk about the luck uh, factor. I was incredibly lucky to have a very supportive parent Mm. who, when I was growing up, I was born in Melton near Woodbridge, uh, grew up until around 10 um, in in Felixstowe on the coast. Mm. And my dream was to to be an actor and to perform. And my supportive parents said, right, well, let's see what we can do. And um, it, it wasn't down to writing out a check I mean it was it was tough and she made a heck of a lot of sacrifices to enable her child to be able to follow his dream so Mm -hmm. that was the first thing really that enabled me to really achieve anything if I have achieved anything in life it's really down to the luck that I've had and it all started with having a fantastic parent. Mm. So what um, what course did you take first where did you go first to start training? I went to Corona Stage School Corona Academy which uh, back in the day was um, on Ravenscourt Park just uh, off Chiswick High Street, down from Hammersmith Broadway, and was famed really for for launching the careers uh, throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. People like Richard O'Sullivan, Nicholas Lindhurst, and many, many others sort of went there and had a traditional education in the mornings. So you know your math, geography. Um, there wasn't much more than that, in all honesty. Mm-hmm. And then in the afternoons on Monday, I remember clearly it was uh, tap dancing on Tuesday. It was uh, Shakespeare and modern literature. Wednesday was ballet. Thursday. I think think was dance and, and, and Friday was uh, speech mm. and voice production. Right. And and that and from that there's an agency and you'll put up for auditions and you may get them, you may not. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned ballet there. Does that have a great deal with your part in Grange Hill? <laughs> <laughs> not at all. No, not at all. I was terrible. I mean, we had, uh, we had, I mean, it was, it was like something from Central Casting. We had a, uh, a former Russian uh, ballerina who had a cane because it was back in the 80s. So you were allowed to go around hitting children on the back of the legs if they mm-hmm. didn't get their leg up quickly enough onto the ballet bar. And I, I really was really lousy. Um, and, you know, there were people at school who wanted to be in dance and wanted to be in musical theatre. I mm-hmm. didn't. And um, I sort of suffered because of my inability to um, in tap dance or ballet be able to get the correct position <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks I've spent many many years doing no. it myself anyway no. <laughs> what, uh, how did, from there is that where you first opportunity came along yes my very first professional gig was for a radio commercial for McDonald's uh, for McDonald's till recently I was over actually still could recall the uh, the sting that we had to uh, we had to sing there was a group of us about five of us mm-hmm. from that other commercials from that stage work film and television and it really was sort of a, a really um, surreal introduction to the profession because you would go along sit in front of a casting director and read out a few lines from a from a script and they'd say yay nay you'd get a call back maybe a, a second call maybe a third call and then the agent would call you to say hey you got the part you mm. got the job and I was just really again lucky that time during the mid 1980s there was a lot of TV costume drama things like Goodbye Mr. Chips to mm. serve them all my days a lot of things that a short back and sides and a winged collar shirt things like Another Country um, 40 Years On things like the Alan Bennett's play mm. yeah I would just I would think I was there at the right time and um, I I had the right sort of look. I don't think it was all down to incredible acting ability, sadly. It just, it just wasn't. You, you, you look right for the past and, hey, you can learn a few lines. That's good. <laughs> You're too modest. You're listening to Susanna Hornby talking with Nick Pandolfi here on the Suffolk Pod Show. 
you that was the 80s. How did you progress in the acting world? So I joined the IRSC as a resident at Barbican for two and a half years mm-hmm. and did regional rep. So there used to be a theatre in, Le- in uh, Leatherhead. We did quite a lot of work there. It was the Dame Sybil Thorndike Theatre. It's been renamed recently because it went dark for some years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and auditioned, even auditioned for uh, Southwall Summer Theatre with Lady Jill Freud. Didn't get the part for that. But basically I became a jobbing actor. And mm-hmm. um, you know, you're as good as, as, as your last performance. Mm-hmm. You mentioned there the, the Alan Bennett play. That was in the West End, I presume. Yes, it was. It was 1984. It was at the Queen's Theatre, as was on Shaftesbury Avenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had seven months, and I was rubbing shoulders with someone who went on to do really well for himself. I think he's still doing it, Stephen Fry. But th- at that point, <laughs> he was, wasn't was long out of, out of Cambridge. And, um, you know, backstage on press nights, you'd have people like Emma Thompson mm. and Hugh Laurie, who we didn't really... We didn't really know who they were because no, they hadn't course. really hit. Um, they hadn't hit the big time. Mm. Um, and people like Ben Elton would come up to you and say, oh, that was really good. We really enjoyed that. And you think, oh, I think I've seen you. Um, oh, like night on Channel 4, possibly. <laughs> but, but, you know, um, and these people have gone on to be, you know, international stars. And we had so, so, we learned so much. I mean, Paul Eddington, um, in 40 years on its set, Between the Wars, mm. uh, we had um, just a great cast. Pe- yeah. People like Doris Hare, who was a vaudeville artist who perhaps was best known throughout the 70s as being mum in On the Buses but she was an incredibly experienced uh, stage actress and we learned so much from her of course. and uh, from, from Stephen Fry whose basic the role it seemed to be was to make the younger members of the cast try and corpse on stage so he would do <laughs> During one of Paul Eddington's monologues, mm-hmm. he was faced, certainly in matinees, no one, I'm not sure many in the profession today would admit to this, but I, I don't know whether this is true still, I don't know. But certainly when we're in this production, matinee performances, we were a little more relaxed. And um, Stephen Fry was particularly good at suddenly going, um, <laughs> during a, a monologue, it, 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 totally oblivious, so the audience were oblivious to it. But, you know, those of us that were standing next to him were trying desperately not to corpse. Of course, the stage manager would tell us off because she would see us giggling, oblivious of the fact that Stephen Fry was going, um, <laughs> under his, uh, moving his mouth, trying to make us laugh. Oh, he still makes us laugh. In fact, he's just one of my absolute yes. favourite actors. From the acting career, you, you eventually moved into radio, or did they did they overlap? Again, I mean, um, I went for an audition. I came home, very little work. So I came back to Suffolk one year, and um, I thought, well, what am I going to do? You know, the auditions are drying up. There isn't a great deal of work going on at the moment. Uh, you, know, you get to a point where you think, maybe my luck's run out. So I went for um, an audition at uh, the Woolsey Theatre. The then artistic director asked me if I would work for less than the equity minimum. This is way back when. They'd never do it now. But so the then artistic director said, would you work for less than the equity minimum? And at that point, the, the British Actors Union was really important and they protected incomes. But obviously, regional theatres found it difficult to pay a larger cast mm-hmm. what the union recommended they ought to be paid. And I sort of thought, as a proud union member and having worked really hard to become a member of equity i said no certainly not and so we didn't i didn't get i didn't get a job mm. came out of the new old if you can picture in the in the center of ipswich and sort of looked around thinking, well, what am i going to do now then because that did, that clearly didn't go well and um i in, out of the corner of my eye, i thought what's that then there's this radio station across the road on st matthew street so yeah. i managed to sort of persuade the reception person to make an appointment for me to see the then editor who was a lovely person who sat in longer with us his name was ivan howard and uh, he was an actor in his past and I think he took sympathy on me. He said, well, why don't you come in and just once a week just review a, a local theatre production? Mm-hmm. And from that, I sort of fell in love with, A, the notion of being paid regularly, like once a month, mm-hmm. but also I didn't have to pretend to be somebody else. I didn't have to learn a script. I, I was introduced to actually being allowed to be myself. And that was quite exciting. What followed after that? Um, within a few weeks, really, I, I was sort of given um, opportunities to fill in for other roles. So I, I became a radio car reporter um, mm-hmm. for weekend programs. So I'd go out and discover a county that I had grown up in, but didn't really know that much about. And from that, really, I discovered an awful lot about Suffolk and learned about Suffolk and learned that one thing that I learned at drama school was key to radio. And that was observation, listening, watching people and allowing others to tell their story. I learned about myself that I was quite good at triggering conversations Mm. and not just talking about me, but actually moving the needle so people would be encouraged to talk about themselves and share their story. And Mm. in speech radio, that's why people tune in. They want to hear someone else's tale. And the knack that I was lucky to find I had Mm. was the ability to encourage people to open up and to share their thought and their story into this German-made ewer, 14 minutes to reel-to-reel tape, hit record, and you know you're going to get some magic, even if you had it edited it within an inch of its life.
Mm. It's wonderful to hear that because, of course, that's what um, storytelling on podcasts is about, too, is handing over and, and allowing people to just blossom into conversation and pulling out memories here, there and everywhere. But it is definitely one of the most popular means of, of audio at the moment. So we're certainly seeing it in our industry. So you had your own program, Nick. Yes, so I I, um, I was very much the the um, the bit part player for for a while, and mm. then as chance would have it, a vacancy came up for the early breakfast show. That's the real Alan Partridge territory where <laughs> you're talking to HDV drivers and people who haven't had a good night's Fantastic. sleep. Fantastic. Playing a collection of music, not necessarily your choice. It very rarely was my choice of music, but nevertheless, mm. you're playing it and you are a pot of glue. You're linking it between a little bit of travel news, a little bit of information. And local radio is unashamedly really good at being great company. And at mm. that time of the morning, I would have regular calls from, from people all over who would say, oh, you know, I've been waiting for you to start. I'd start at 5 a.m., go mm. through until 6.30 a.m., and then I would drive the breakfast show. In those days, it was still reel-to-reel tapes and carts and uh, ISBN lines and all the rest. And you basically had to drive the breakfast presenters' um, program for them. Um, they do it themselves now. Um, yeah. They found a, they found a way of saving money. Let's let's get rid of the uh, studio ops and uh, let's actually make the presenters do all the work themselves. Mm. And it was just I just learned so much about audio and sound and yeah. again people and um, and technology. And it, it was I was you know it's either you can ride a bike or you can't. And I was just really lucky that I could talk and open and close a at the same time. Was it through radio that you became such a well-known voiceover artist? Well, from radio comes voiceover work. Because you realise that actually there's, there's potential here for income mm. um, because someone gives you a script and you're able to, to read read aloud, blind read, as they say. And from that, got an agent and um, and then you become the, the voice of products that people find under their sink mm. and you think hey this is a career high i am the voice of bleach in belgium uh, no, but, <laughs> yeah but you are the voice that people are so used to listening to you know it's just oh, it's very comforting you're listening to susanna hornby talking with nick pandolfi here on the suffolk pod show What, what was your first voiceover artist job? I want to know. I was a cherry tomato in a small animation for a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you be? Why wouldn't you be? At that point, did I know that my career high would be that I'd become a bottle of bleach? But at that point, I was still in the fresh produce range. Yeah, no, and I yeah. was a cherry tomato. Definitely. And I was a very squeaky voice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. An elevation, a promotion of sorts. <laughs> so from uh, from the chiller cabinet to the household item. Mm. But you, you, you never know. With voiceovers, you never know what you're going to get next. Bang up to date. I mean, I'm audio books and, uh, and and narration mm. and that's um as enjoyable as being bleach or a cherry tomato, or a tomato. It's also a little, it's a little better paid as well because the scripts tend to be longer of course of course have you done any feature films <laughs> yes i was lucky enough to be in a few really that um and did quite well so uh if you look carefully and uh, you, you hit pause you can find me in gandhi um you can find me in octopussy and you can find me in a film if you like horror films brimstone and treacle is particularly good that stars 1980s police lead man Sting. It's a very dark, dark movie. Uh, also, a film called Reunion that did quite well um, was nominated um, at the Cannes Film Festival way back when. And um, that was an American actor, a great American actor, again, who was just wanted to be working alongside Jason Robards, who mm. um, just had such a pedigree of history to him that it was uh, it was very special and i actually meant have you ever done um any voiceover for like narration in cartoons and feature films sort of disney-esque type things games are again huge work opportunities for, for voiceover artists uh, and yes that, are, that yeah. has um, been that being a gaming voice has been uh, has been quite important and um, it's really enjoyable i mean the industry's changed radically we used to we used to sort of all be called in and go to often quite dusty studios one that i used to go to was in the heart of soho and that seemed to be my horn where I was always going and um, it was in Berwick Street near Berwick Street Market mm -hmm. so really in a, in a very sort of uh, very very historic part of London um, with real characters around and you'd go into this sort of smart-ish looking office and then go down into a bit of a dungeon <laughs> and I just remember one tale in particular when I was, I know, I was probably in my 30s the, the representative of the product a client was there and obviously the studio team were there and the uh, the engineer the, the sound engineer they're your best friend really because ultimately they, they know more than the client and more than the Produce how good this product is going to sound or not, and and they would say, "Oh, that chair." I said, "He said you're right with the chair," and I said, "Yeah, it's fine. It's really old, sort of very, strangely quite a creaky chair in a voiceover booth. You would think they'd have a silent chair." Mm -hmm. He said, "Oh, we're, we're, we're really fond of that." He said, um, "Mick Jagger was in that chair last week," and you sort of thought the history of this of this rather sort of dusty, run down looking 
studio and you thought, my goodness, the, the amount of people that, you know, if walls could talk and that cliche, the mm. amount of talent that's been in this room and here you are just adding your little bit to the production line of this building. Phenomenal when you think about things like that. We were just, um, I was just reading in the newspapers last week that they're completely refitting Denmark Street and what a history that has, more so in the music field. But, oh, for me, uh, yes. uh, phenomenal what they're doing in London now. But I do hope those dusty old studios are still around because they are, as you say, painted in history and you feel quite special being in Mick Jagger's chair. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this. I remember going to Abbey Wood. So back in the days when to to Abbey Road, I should say to Abbey Road, to just went back in the days when EMI still owned it. And I, I sort of looked at the photographs um, of the Beatles performing that and realised that actually we were in the studio that they would have recorded some of their work. The studio in question, if you look at any of the Beatles photos online at mm. Abbey Road, you'll see there's a, there's a staircase that goes down. This sort of and what looks like a residential house, sort of 13 steps going down. So I know I think it. It's the main yeah. studio. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, and you know, there's a piano in the corner it's really mm. quite a vast space and I thought, oh yeah I've been there I, I have mm. to say the work we did there wasn't wasn't as important to anyone as the work that had gone on before but nevertheless to be able to walk in the footsteps of great yeah. that's what's always excited me about being in the profession that I've been in now for 41 years mm. which is you just you just soak up so much history but you also learn from really creative people who on the whole tend to be really nice and very generous mm. and will give you tips and it's your job to make sure that you learn from them and improve yourself mm. inspiring totally inspiring you're listening to Susanna Hornby talking with Nick Pandolfi here on the Suffolk Pod Show Bringing us up now to today, current times, Nick, um, what are you doing at the moment? Right at the moment, I'm uh, working on a project, finishing it off, that's going to be aired on Radio 4 before Christmas, Mm -hmm. between Christmas and New Year, which uh, looks at the 40th anniversary of the alleged UFO landing in Rendlesham Forest in in the heart of Suffolk. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago today, did they come and visit us, or was it all just a great big hoax? Well, um, I was lucky enough to be involved in capturing some of the audio from some of those people who were around 40 years ago, Mm -hmm. who saw it, believe what they saw, and have a great deal more to throw into this uh, conspiracy theory of, oh, well, it was the SAS checking out, uh, testing the Americans' ability to protect the two bases, RF Woodbridge as it was, and old bent water sites. Mm. Or was it really? Or was it Orford Lighthouse that the lights were actually coming through the forest? So that's a really nice project that's uh, more or less in the can, done and dusted. Superb. And, and well, yeah. yeah. Just got to say, we were only watching the entire program on it, uh, what, two or three months ago. And there is a lot of mystery and interest around that. A lot. I remember interviewing an author and she told me, I said, so what is it? I said, was it, was it aliens? And, and she threw something that I had never considered. Because I sort of have a skeptical, I sit on the fence with a lot of things. In broadcast, you have to because you hear differing opinion. And she said to me, well, maybe it wasn't aliens. Maybe it was us time traveling back to that point in time. Maybe it was us in the future visiting us in the past. And I thought, wow, well, there's a whole new series of, of thoughts and books to come from that. My goodness. Where, where will we be able to watch it? You, you'll be able to hear it on, on uh, BBC Radio 4 and yeah. it'll be on the iPlayer. Post that for 30 days as well. Fantastic. Nick, right now you're doing work with Mentor. Amazing work, actually, because we know you're absolutely passionate about good content. Can you tell us specifically how you've helped some people or rather some businesses in the local area recently? Yeah, absolutely. So I was really uh, fortunate once more to, I'd been, I was out of work. Um, the radio station I was working for decided that um, they were going to reinvent the wheel and they got rid of a whole load of staff. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Yeah. And someone said, well, there's this organization based in Barry Snevins that works across Norfolk and Suffolk. They're called Mentor, uh, Mentor Business Support. And it helps SMEs. And my role is to help small medium enterprises target their audience with good content. Mm-hmm. The mistake that sometimes people make in smaller businesses is that they have a great story. Everyone has a great story to share, but sometimes we put it in the wrong platforms. We put it in the wrong avenue. Mm. So if you make award-winning, fantastic pork sausages, you don't want to be advertising that in Vegan Weekly, do you? Because it's unlikely that your many, many of your customers will be there. Not ideal. Uh, so it's about finding the right, <laughs> finding the right content and marrying that with the right platform. And the beauty of what, what you touched on earlier is that uh, we all now are publishers. We're all now media outlets. We don't need to go to the traditional media platforms. Mm. We can create our own content. We can publish our own content, whether it be on YouTube, Facebook, in a podcast, whatever route we take. We just need to focus on the story that we have and share that content and make sure that people understand and engage with it. That's the new way to do media. Mm. And more and more people are doing it. And sometimes we just, those of us that uh, 
didn't grow up with Facebook, we just need a little bit of uh, a helping hand sometimes. And that's my role is mm. to make sure that uh, we get the right content on the right platform and we target the audience correctly. And alongside helping SMEs, you're always on the lookout, aren't you, for spotting a little talent here and there as well. For, tell us about Ben Kuma. Oh, well, yes. So uh, Ben is, uh, is a very successful business person um, based in Suffolk, uh, went to school locally as well, mm-hmm. and decided to transform his life. He was morbidly obese as a teenager and um, turned his life around and is now on iTunes, the UK's number one download podcast when it comes to his particular sector, which is health and nutrition. Mm-hmm. And and I'm always, as I mentioned earlier, you always want to be listening and watching people. And I fell across him by accident, I think through Twitter. And I invited him in onto my then radio show and said, well, why don't you talk about this weekly? And from that became a very popular conversation that people tuned in for, not necessarily always agreeing with Ben and not always agreeing with me. When he was talking about nutrition, I was saying, yeah, but what about Madeira cake? Um, and so <laughs> we sort of developed this um, chalk and cheese approach to nutrition. Mm. He, I think, was inspired by that. He tells me and um, wanted to create more and more content. He created Ben Kuma uh, Radio. And as I say, it's been UK's number one download uh, mm. on iTunes. For, mm. for a number of years and uh, that sort of um, talent is everywhere to be found in Suffolk. I mean, if you, if another name to watch is Alexander Baxter, he created a business not that many years ago. He's a very young entrepreneur in, in the Woodbridge area mm. and it's called Baxter and Baxter and his social media is amazing. His product's amazing. It's a really clever business individual. Others, you know, one thing that Suffolk's very bad at, I think, is collectively bringing people together and you and social media allows that it's, it's a short mm. window for so much talent which whatever the sector is you can find really good businesses really good people creatives mm. actually they just need a little bit of celebrating yep. and if um, you can play a role play a small part in bringing making more people a wider audience aware of what what's out there if i've done that in a small way over the years i'm, I'm well someone needs to do it it's it's up to the next generation of radio presenters to make sure that they're doing it as well i'm sure that they are yeah no i'm sure that they are and i mean as you just said i mean that's what we're about too is is basically celebrating and promoting how great suffolk is as a togetherness and uh, every which way we can do that the more the better quite frankly there's an awful lot to celebrate mm. in Suffolk. Yeah, it's not the chocolate box, um, sleepy county that some people in North London would, would uh, have you believe. Mm. You know, for everything that's great about Suffolk, there's a lot wrong. You know, there's far too much used food banks. You can travel between Lowestoft and Warbleswick and see a, a massive change in income. But at the same time, there are really incredibly creative businesses. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a young musician. He's a singer, songwriter, just signed a deal with Sony in Sweden. He's working out of the studio of Woodbridge Road mm. in Ipswich. Which his name's AJ um, Adam, and yeah, you know, he's worked with a business um, that really helped promote him and craft him called Hayden Media. Daniel Hayden Scott. You don't people don't necessarily know about it unless they go and look for it because mm. I think rightly wrongly we're not very good in the county at actually celebrating what's out there. And this podcast is a, is a, is a great vehicle for people to be able to to find that sort of person mm. and actually shout about just how good we are. We mm. don't have the big skies. We don't just have the pink cottages. We have a lot of real talent here that is doing it every day. It's just that one voice doesn't shout about it enough, in my opinion. Mm, I couldn't have put it better. Obviously, you're working with Mentor still. Are you currently news reporting? Did I read that? Are you corresponding for New Zealand or is that is that finished now? No, I'm, I'm still doing that. So for Radio New Zealand, um, I'm the UK correspondent. And uh, where are we? I was talking to them yesterday morning, 5.30 UK time, which is of afternoon. They're just about to go into daylight saving. And I have to say, that's why I, I have to check online to see what, what the time difference is. But uh, that was late afternoon when I was talking live on the radio, talking about the current news situation in the UK, usually mentioning something about the royal family, something about Brexit, and obviously at the moment, something about the pandemic. Mm, we're definitely going to tune in or find you at least. <laughs> definitely, Nick. You can find, you can find it online. <laughs> okay. you, can find, you can find it online. I think they do catch up. You don't have to go up at 5.30 in the morning UK time to hear it live on Radio New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, if people want to get in touch with you, if they just want to have a chat or, or whatever, how do, we, how do people get to you? How do we find you? Um, telepathy doesn't work. You're right. No. So, drop me an email. I have a website, uh, nicholaspandolfi.co.uk, mm-hmm. and uh, that's a mouthful to remember. No one, many people can't spell Nicholas. 
Um, so as for Pandolfi, it's, it's a surname I have to spell. I have to I'm spell just putting my hand up least, right now. <laughs> <laughs> at least once a day. Um, so yeah, on Twitter, you'll find you'll find me on Twitter. Right. Uh, Nic yeah. Nick Pandolfi. Okay. Um, say hello. Right, you heard him. Go and get in touch with him, Nick. Thank you <laughs> so much. Brilliant. It's so lovely to talk to you. I could carry on for hours actually, but we can't. So just to say thank you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. No, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the invitation. It's our pleasure. Bye bye. To get in touch with Nick, go to nicholaspandolfi.co.uk. Thanks for listening to the Suffolk Pod Show. Find us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Or you can visit our website, podtalk.co.uk. And here's our disclaimer. The Suffolk Pod Show will not be held responsible for any omissions or errors in its podcast. The Suffolk Pod Show is produced purely for entertainment purposes. Views and opinions are that of our own or that of our guests.